Okay, so welcome to this next video on the theory of probability. Uh, in this video, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, generalize the concept of transformations of random variables uh, to transformations of joint random variables. Uh, specifically, in this video, we're going to do bivariate distributions, so where you have two random variables, x and y, if you like. Um, and then in the next video, we'll do three dimensions, and then we'll generalize it to n dimensions. So, uh, let's start with two dimensions. So, uh, let's uh, we start off with our abstract probability space here, and we have two random variables on it. So let's say x is a random variable which is mapping you, let's say, onto the real line, and y is another random variable which is mapping you onto the real line, and together uh, we can for make them into a joint random variable which we could call x and y, uh, which maps you onto ordered pairs. So it maps you onto R2, basically. So uh, every outcome in here, so let's have a little outcome in here, is being mapped onto a real number by X of S. So by X, sorry. So uh, S goes to X of S, and it's also being mapped onto a real number by Y. So Y goes to Y of S. And uh, therefore, what we can ascribe to this real number, we could, sorry, we, what we could ascribe to this outcome is an ordered pair of real numbers. So we could ascribe it the ordered pair X of S, Y of S, uh, which is a, the concept of a joint random variable that uh, instead of ascribing it to uh, real number, uh, well, the, 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 the concept of a joint random variable is the equivalence between these two things. That ascribing two uh, real numbers is equivalent to ascribing a single point in the plane R2, i.e. a single ordered pair of real numbers. Okay, uh, so what we, are now, what we now have is, what we're now going to have is a function g which is mapping R2, so it's going to map R2 onto R2. So this is the difference basically now. Uh, our, in the uh, transformations of random variables, all the ones that we've seen so far are just mapping R onto R. Uh, so we have, for instance, E of X was a, an example that we saw in the case of the log normal. Now what we have is a function mapping R2 onto R2. So let me give you an example of such a function. So what you could imagine doing is having a function which simply rotates every point by 90 degrees. So if we have the point 1, 0 here in the plane, uh, then the function that rotates it will map 1, 0 onto 0, 1. So basically it takes any point in here and it will map it onto the point in here which is rotated by 90 degrees. Degrees. Okay, so that's a perfectly good mapping, uh, which is going to map every point in here onto a point on he in here. That is actually a, a linear transformation. It can be expressed in terms of uh, linear functions, i.e. functions where you just have uh, the variables x and y with constants in front of them. And, you know, these sort of functions are very important in linear algebra. Um, so um, what we want to now do is uh, try and work out if we have a transformation like this, and if we act it on this probability space here, so it's going to take every ordered pair in here, and it's going to ascribe it a new ordered pair uh, in some new R2, spa R2 space over here. What If we know the probability density function on here, if we know the joint probability density function, let's say f of x and y as a function of little x and little y, which remember is a function ascribing to every little point, little x and little y, it ascribes um, the probability density, i.e. if you have a tiny little box of size, uh, side lengths delta x and delta y, and you want to know the probability that you're within that tiny little box, then the probability that you're within that tiny little box is this probability density function evaluated at that point, little x, little y, times delta x, delta y. Y, so times the uh, area of this little box. So that's why it's called a probability density function. It doesn't give you the probability, but if you times it by a tiny little area, then that will pro approximately give you the probability that you're within that little area, basically. So you have to get a region, and instead what it's telling you is how, how dense the probability is within a little region, basically. It's not like the probability mass function, where uh, you ascribe uh, a probability to, apps, to each point, and the actual point has a probability. 
are of actually happening. No, in this case, if you put an individual point, so for continuous random variables, if you put each individual point, uh, each individual ordered pair into a set and call that an event, then the probability of that event is equal to zero if it's a continuous random variable. Of course, you can have bivariate discrete random variables, and we've seen examples, uh, but uh, in full general generality, we'll have a probability density function. If the discrete random variables, the way that you transform them is simpler than this. Okay, uh, so you just um, you, it's very similar to the way you did it in um, in a single variable. Okay, so uh, now what we want to do is try and transform this probability density function into uh, let's say f of g of x and y basically. So this is the transformed random variable here, g of x and y, which is also going to be a function of some little x and some little y. So we want to know if I take a point, uh, little x and little y, in this um, in this new uh, R2 space here, what's the probability density function there? I If I make a little box here with side lengths that say um, in fact, we should have called these some different variables. Let's call this the point uv. So we'll call this uh, a function of u and v. And let's call these side lengths delta u and delta v. So delta u and delta v. OK? Uh, so what we want to know is if we we want to know what this probability density function for this random variable is. So we want to know what f of g of big X, big Y, as a function of little u and little v, is, basically. Now, all we know is the de definition of this. By definition, what we want this to satisfy, basically, is that if we multiply it by delta u and delta v, we want that uh, if delta u and delta v are absolutely tiny, we want that uh, to approximately be the probability that it's within that region, basically. So we want this to be uh, the probability that within that region. So I'll call this little box B. So we want this to be equal to uh, the probability that you're within that little box. So I'll call this P double prime that you're within that little box, where P double prime is the probability measure on this probability space. And will that P prime be the probability measure that you're on that space, and P be the probability that you're in this space? OK, uh, the probability measure on that space, sorry. Uh, right, OK, uh, so what we need to know now is we need to calculate what's the probability that you're in that region. Then we'd have what this value is, basically. Uh, so what we need to do, basically, is we need to take the inverse image of this little box in this probability space here. So we need to take it in here, and then we need to use the fact that we know the probability density function on this probability space to work out the probability that you're within the pre-image of this little box over here. So, um, firstly what we need to do is work out where does the little point, uh, little u and little v, come from, basically. So which point in here was mapped onto this little value, little u and little v, uh, in here. Now, of course, this function might not be onto. Uh, again, um, the conditions that we want this to satisfy, this function to satisfy, is we want it to be one-to-one, i.e. we want a single point on here to be ascribed a single point in here, and basically we want that point uh, to have only, if it does have a pre-image, if there was a point in here which was mapped onto that point, we want there to be only one point, i.e. we don't want more than one point in this space. We don't want there to be, let's say, two points that are mapped onto the same point in here. That's what injective means, or one-to-one. -one. Um, what we don't insist on is we don't insist that it is onto. We don't insist that it's subjective. So we don't insist that if you take any point in here that it is necessary that there is a point in here that was mapped onto it. That's not necessary. It's like uh, the exponential in the single variable case. Uh, the exponential maps every real number onto an individual real number in uh, the codomain. But there isn't necessarily there isn't a, ne a real number that's mapped onto negative one. So although every single real number is ascribed its own real number in the codomain by the exponential function, not every uh, real number in the codomain does uh, have a point that was ascribed it basically. Okay, uh, so let me just draw a picture to clarify that. So if we draw the exponential out here, so if I take any two real numbers, uh, let's say this one here and this one here, they are ascribed different real numbers, so they are not ascribed the same one. There are no two real numbers along here that are ascribed the same value. However, uh, it does not map you onto the entire real numbers, because if I take minus 5 down here, there was no real number along all of this that was ascribed the number minus 5. Indeed, they're all ascribed just positive. 
positive numbers. Okay, uh, so uh, that's um, we're going to insist similarly that this function is injective, i.e. that if this point uv had a point that was mapped onto it by this function, it has a unique point that was mapped onto it. So the only two cases that there can possibly be is that it has absolutely no pre-image or that it has a single pre-image. It cannot have more than one point that was mapped onto it, basically. So that's the concept that we're going to insist on. g is injective. We're also going to obviously want that g is differentiable g is differentiable. Okay, if you want to make it simpler, you can insist that it's bijective, i.e. that it is injective and subjective, which is the concept that every single point in here does have an inverse in there. Uh, so uh, it's mapped onto the entire thing. Every point does have an inverse image, and that inverse image is unique, so it only has a single inverse image. That's the concept of bijective functions. And indeed, that rotation example that we had originally was a bijection. Okay, uh, so... Uh, if uv has, but if we've insisted that it is just injective, then either uv has an inverse image in this um, in this R2 plane, or it doesn't have an inverse image. Let's say it does have an inverse image. If it doesn't, we'll just declare the probability density function to be zero there. If it does, then take that pre-image. So let's say this is uh, g inverse of uh, the point uv, basically. Uh, so uh, let's call that little point xy in this probability space, okay? So we have the pre-image, the point, the order pair that was mapped onto our order pair uv by the function g, we are calling x and y. Okay, so that that's, uh, that's a good start. Now what we need to do is uh, we need to work out what this little box becomes in this probability space, and that's the difficult bit. How do you convert this box back into what it is over here? Okay, well, uh, basically we have to use a concept called the Jacobian, and we'll explore that in the next video.